before we get on to uh, the lecture, I'm just going to do uh, explain a little bit about how it's going to uh, work. Um, you can use the Q&A and the chat to ask questions. Um, we have with us some people who are helping answer uh, the questions. Um, we have Zoe, who you've just met, and also Kirsty, who is admissions counsellor uh, at um, AUR. And so if there's any questions to do with the university or the programme, they will be uh, answering uh, your questions there. Uh, we also have uh, with us, uh, helping us um, today, uh, Melissa Metzger. Um, Melissa is a graduate of our program and she's just completed her thesis, in fact, on trafficking. So uh, she's very well up in uh, these uh, matters. And uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Sama Abdel Ghaffour. Uh, Sama also specializes, is his speciality also is in um, trafficking of um, illegal. Um, illicit uh, antiquities. Um, but uh, Sama is also an Arab speaker. I know that we have uh, a lot of uh, Arabic speakers signed up for uh, this program. So um, he, if you wish to write your questions uh, in the chat or the Q&A in Arabic, please feel free to do so because um, he will be able to answer them for you. Um, the other uh, thing I'd just like to say is that when you've got your um, link to, to register for this program, um, there was also a link to the Facebook page, and I would encourage you to go on to the Facebook page um, to sign up there and join in the discussions that, um, that are there. Um, the what we will be doing um, in this presentation is I'll be talking for about 40 45 minutes, um, and then um, the last 10 or 15 minutes we're going to have uh, in some guest speakers who are people who actually work in the field uh, that we're discussing the topic, people who are professionals in that area, who can give us another perspective on it. We're very pleased this evening to have with us someone who is an antiquities analyst with law enforcement in America, and I'll be introducing her a little bit later. She also is a graduate of our program, and so we're very uh, proud of her and very um, uh, pleased at the work she's doing, uh, which is very, very um, important work. Um, so I will now uh, share my screen and uh, we'll go on to the, uh, the presentation. Okay, so uh, what we're going to look at in this presentation are museums. Now, I'm sure most of us have uh, grown up thinking of museums as places that you go to to gain an education, places that uh, we entrust to keep our best cultural treasures. But recently, museums have been uh, hitting the headlines for something that's not quite as um, not quite as elevated as that. Increasingly, museums are being taken to task because they are exhibiting items that are stolen. Now, what I'm going to discuss here is not historical um, stealing, um, that is, items that were taken during uh, colonial times, although that will be important to our, our discussion today, um, I'm actually talking about things that are being stolen now, whilst in this period in time. There are thefts going on, which are being um, trafficked for 
around the world uh, for huge sums of money. Um, and they're ending up in some of our most prestigious museums. Well, how can that happen? Why, why would that happen? You would think that museums, having been around for a long time, would be would not get themselves in this situation. They certainly don't aim to get themselves in this situation. So how does that come about? Well, partly I think it's to do with our own romanticized image of what art crime is. It's never really been taken as seriously as perhaps it should have been. I think the public often have an idea of art crime as being something that is, uh, you know, passion, people passionate for art and they can't resist it, they can't help themselves. Um, but in actual fact, unfortunately, it's not really like that. It's not full of people who are as um, glamorous and high-minded as that. In fact, it's more often like this. It's more often part of just crime, which is sordid and violent and not, not very elevated at all, in fact. The people who steal works of art uh, are not themselves um, lovers of art. They are people who commit crime for money, um, essentially. But one of the reasons we get a little bit confused in this is because the public face of art crime often can look like this. Uh, what we're looking at here is the opening of uh, a new gallery in the New York Metropolitan Museum. This is a gallery in ancient art, and it's called the Shelby White and Leon Levy uh, Gallery because they were the people who paid for it, and indeed a lot of the works of art in it um, are from their collections. And here is uh, Shelby White. She's the lady in the green dress. Uh, she is at the opening um, of the gallery and they're having a cocktail party, which is very, uh, you know, the sort of the good and the great were invited, full of celebrities. Uh, now, I'm going to be coming back to Shelby White at the end of the presentation, so we'll just keep her in mind for the minute and um, move on. So... Why do reputable museums end up with stolen objects? And why does this seem to be happening more frequently? Is it because museum employees are engaged in criminal activity? Or are they careless? Are they not, not checking enough? Or are they being hoodwinked by criminals? And how many museums are actually implicated in this? Are there, is it all museums? Is it just one or two bad apples? Or is it a practice that's pretty pervasive? Well, my argument tonight is going to be that there has always been a tradition of a very lax approach to acquisitions. And there are historical reasons for this. And that this has led to a culture within museums and perhaps within the public at large, which has not taken this crime very seriously. And as a result, it has allowed it to uh, burgeon out of control um, and become something which is much more pervasive than probably we want it to be, and has very serious consequences in today's society. Now, what are the historical reasons why perhaps museums have never had a very robust policy towards their acquisitions? Well, first of all, most prestigious museums built up their collections a long time ago, before there were laws uh, preventing the export of art and, art and antiquities. And that's particularly true of European museums. Um, 
the big European museums were um, often formed, uh, formed their collections in the second half of the 18th century, um, perhaps the beginning of the 19th century, um, and often in periods before, not only were there export laws from countries, but sometimes the countries themselves didn't exist. Um, and their objects were very easy to take out of the country and to bring back to uh, places far away. And then through various reasons, they end up in a museum collection. Um, sometimes it's connected with empire building. Um, European countries, uh, as I'm sure you will know, have uh, had extensive overseas empires. Um, those empires were treated as possessions. They, um, the imperial power had, um, had control over it uh, and they could move objects around without permission from the source country. This, of course, is something that is a major issue for many museums. And what I'm showing you here is the British Museum's Benin artifacts from Benin in Nigeria. I know we have some people uh, tonight here from Nigeria, and uh, they will, I'm sure, uh, be very familiar uh, with this situation. Um, but Mostly these objects that were taken by colonial powers, to take the objects was um, immoral, it was unethical, it was unfair, but it was for the most part not illegal as such because they had jurisdiction there. Um, and this shows you the background to the Benin objects. Um, they Oh, I just have to move this out of the way so I can see what I'm looking at. Um, the Benin objects, this is the British forces who attacked Benin, essentially over a trade dispute. Uh, and indeed a great deal of this, um, uh, what happened in colonial uh, period was ultimately to do with trade. Um, and they took the... Um, the artifacts, the objects from the Benin royal family as a punishment, essentially. Um, there's a very good book, if you wish to extend your knowledge on this, um, on this, this aspect, very good book by a man called Dan Hicks called The Brutish Museums, which goes into this in some depth. Then there's also the role of archaeological excavations. Archaeological excavations became part of um, colonial expansion. Um, it was um, it was really I often think of it's quite similar to how today um, sports has become a kind of proxy for uh, war and for political um, uh, showing political superiority. In the 19th century, it was often archaeology that did. Um, foreign expeditions went abroad, went to places, excavated, and then took the objects back, thereby demonstrating their cultural superiority as they saw it, their ability to control another um, culture. Um, and many um, countries lost a lot of their um, uh, objects to foreign museums in this way. Um, it was of dubious legality, it wasn't always clearly illegal, um, very hard to get the objects back in this day and age. Uh, but again, it shows how museums got used to a very lax way of obtaining their collections. They, they, they didn't really ask a lot of questions. They felt that they had the right to be the trustees of these objects. They didn't care very much about the people um, from whom they took these objects. Um, they had a sense of uh, proprietorship over the objects. Um, and so I think that explains a great deal what has happened 
um, what happens today, because there's not an embedded culture of caring about this. Uh, there is a culture that sees the museum as having the right to do that, as in some way doing it for the public good. And this is part, definitely part of the problem. Um, the scale of it was quite uh, phenomenal. Um, so, uh, and it became very competitive between the different European countries in particular, and also America later on, um, as they would compete to have the best collections. So for example, these are from the um, British Museum, absolutely massive collection of um, objects of um, the Assyrian culture. And because they had that, then the Louvre very much wanted to have a big collection as well. And so they begin to compete with each other. Um, and then that, of course, is um, becomes a very lucrative market for people who go out and excavate, um, or, you know, maybe we don't even want to glorify it with that name, people who go out and um, uh, dig up these antiquities, and they know that they can sell them to a museum, and the museum doesn't ask too many questions about where they came from. Now, the empires fell. Um, the, they decline in the 20th century. Some of them disappear after World War I. By the time you get to World War II, the aftermath of World War II, uh, all of them disappear. Um, gradually they fall and the colonies get independence. Um, a lot of them then want their cultural heritage back, but that's another, um, another argument that is a, a lecture in itself. Um, but although the political situation changed, um, the attitudes didn't. Museums kept on in much the same way. And this is made very clear by the memoirs of uh, Gisela Richter. Gisela Richter was curator at the New York Metropolitan Museum for most of the first half of the uh, 20th century. Um, and she trained the people who came after her. So uh, it can be said that her influence went on throughout most of the 20th century. And her memoirs, give us a great insight into how museums ran during that time. She's talking here about a Greek statue, a um, kouros. And um, the, the kouros uh, had been, it has been established that it was uh, stolen and uh, it had uh, been acquired by the New York Met. And she's trying to defend the situation. And she says, uh, we had nothing whatsoever to do with its export. We'd bought the statue from a Swiss dealer. Now that was a very common way that museums acquired objects, either from a Swiss dealer or from a Lebanese dealer. Uh, for example, Lebanon and Switzerland were places that were famous as places to put um, objects with a dodgy provenance through. Um, because Switzerland would then uh, issue an export license from Switzerland. But it doesn't tell you anything about the provenance of that object before Switzerland. And what Gisela Richter is saying here, she says, when I afterwards went to Greece, I took the opportunity of telling my friends there about this. And then she's, her friends obviously are people who are very high up in the cultural uh, world in uh, Greece. So uh, her friends are very reassuring to her because they say, if you had not bought the statue, some other museum would have. So what she's actually saying is that she bought a statue, an item which she had 
every reason to believe might have been stolen because she bought it from a Swiss dealer. So technically it had an export license, but she didn't know anything about what had happened to it, how it got to the Swiss dealer. But her friends reassure her that she's not doing anything out of the ordinary in doing that. And indeed, she's doing a service really to the world because she's giving this statue a home. And any if she doesn't do it, then someone else will do it. And they might not be as uh, good a place to be as the New York Met. And I think that really tells you everything about how museums operated at that time. They didn't see what they were doing as wrong. They had always operated like that and they didn't change. Uh, society changed, the world changed, geopolitics changed, but they didn't change, they kept on. And American museums um, were particularly, I would say, ones that were likely to end up with such objects. And that's because they had a need to um, increase their collections and they had the money to do it. Um, American museums began about a century after European museums. Most European museums of the prestigious European museums, they had their origins back in a time when there wasn't, um, there weren't a lot of uh, export rules. If there were laws and regulations, they weren't that well enforced. Um, and by and large, art was cheaper. By the time American museums begin, which is in the late 19th century, um, there are nation states. The nation states have export rules um, and uh, art is more expensive. But the one thing that America has is money. Uh, America has um, had a very, um, a very efficient industrial revolution. Its industry is going well. Uh, a lot of people are making a lot of money. So America has the money to buy the collections and it has the desire to rival European museums. There's a great rivalry between uh, museums and um, it was part of America's coming of age really, what is sometimes called the Gilded Age of America, is that it wanted its cultural basis to be, to be as good as Europe. And this is even more true further on in the 20th century um, when um, John Paul Getty decided the richest man in the world decided that he would invest his vast wealth in uh, that he made in the oil business that he would invest it in art and he opened first of all the Getty Villa at Malibu in um, California uh, this is a replica of uh, a Roman villa, but quite modest in size, though uh, very beautifully made. And then um, he later on, um, when he died, the money went into an endowment and the Getty became the wealthiest art institution in um in the world at one point and set up the Getty Center um, and was able to spend huge sums of money on acquiring a new collection. Um, they not only were able to, they were more or less obliged to by the terms of the will. Um, so suddenly this huge, sort of investment in art is um, pumped into the art market in the last third of the 20th century. And prices kind of go through the roof, really. Um, all the other museums have to compete. By and large, the European museums cannot compete. They don't have that kind of money, especially uh, European museums that run off public money. And it's very hard for them to compete with this. American museums could, and in particular, the really big ones, 
uh, American museums have always been able to leverage private donors. This is something that until quite um, recently, uh, European museums have not done so much of. European museums often collect, um, often have donations from collectors, particularly in lieu of taxes, um, but they're not really uh, entrepreneurial um, in the sense of going out and getting people to donate money. Uh, America, on the other hand, museums have pretty much always run this way, and there's a very um, efficient um, system of um, tax relief for people who donate, uh, which has been running for a very long time and so um, is very embedded in the art market culture. And the influx of money that came because of uh, Getty's endowment meant that the art market is suddenly um, almost overheating as there's so much oxygen being um, put into it. And this was very annoying to the source countries. Um, we call the countries that, um, where the art and antiquities comes from, the source countries or the host countries. And then the countries where the art and antiquities arrive, well, they are the destination countries. Um, and the source countries were very annoyed at seeing all their art and antiquities being just uh, looted and sent abroad. And Italy in particular suffered a great deal from this. And in 1969, it uh, set up uh, a branch of the Carabinieri, which was going to be devoted specifically to this. It was called the TPC, the Tutela Patrimonio di Carabinieri. This was done ahead of the UNESCO convention, which was aimed to stop uh, trafficking. Um, I think it has to be said that for the first couple of decades of its existence, the TPC was not as effective as it might have been. But certainly now in the 21st century, it has been shown to be without doubt, the best unit in the world for fighting art and antiquities trafficking. Um, there is um, uh, an investment in resources, which is way above other countries, and they run a lot of training courses to train other um, police forces around the world. So ultimately it came into its own, but it was not especially effective um, in the first couple of decades, I would say, of, uh, of its existence. It took a little while to get going, as did indeed the 1970 UNESCO Convention uh, on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export and transfer of ownership of cultural property. Um, so quite a mouthful. Um, usually just known as the Anti-Trafficking Convention. And this was a kind of, um, it was an important point, though once again, it was not immediately effective. Um, I think it's, I think a lot of people have, don't have a very clear idea of what a UN convention is, because it is not a law. Uh, you can't, prosecute someone for not, not conforming to this. That is, unless the nation state or state's party has taken the convention and passed it through the legislature, then you can, then you can um, say, okay, this person has broken the law. But until it gets passed by the state's parties, then, um, it really is not effective. There were three essential aspects of the UNESCO Convention. Firstly, 
prevention through what's called national measures. And that means that everybody had to pass a law. Um, you can't prosecute somebody in America for stealing from Italy if Italy itself doesn't have a law that makes that illegal. So the nation states have to have laws themselves. And you can't really have an effective law unless you have an inventory of items. Um, because you can't prosecute somebody for stealing something if there was no evidence that this item existed and it belonged to somebody else. And you also need to do what's called listing, which is to make sure that you know what are your um, most uh, important objects and buildings. You have to have some way of identifying them so that other countries can act. The second pillar was called restitution, um, which means that if you discover you've got something that was illegally exported into your country, it has to go back. And 1970 was set as the benchmark for this. Now, there are many people who object to that and say, well, that's, you know, what happens to something before 1970. And it's true that it's not a very satisfactory um, state of affairs, but I think it was a pragmatic decision to say, let's draw a line in the sand because there are so many objects that are difficult that we have to uh, try and give ourselves a problem that's at least capable of being resolved. And then the third part was the most difficult international cooperation to control the trade. And this has always been the part which has been most difficult um, because the source countries and the host countries are usually two completely different things. Um, but what you're asking a host country to do is to devote resources to tackling a crime, which is actually not their crime. You're asking them to devote resources to tackling a crime which affects another country. And indeed, not only is it not affecting them, they might even be damaging themselves because art dealers, um, they, you know, are well-off people often, they pay taxes. So you're actually attacking people who in your own country are claiming to do a legitimate business and pay tax. And the damage that is being done is not in your country, but in uh, another country. And that's always been one of the problems in trying to get people to collaborate. So the 1970 convention has been very hard to implement. So much so that, um, oops, uh, so much so that in actual fact, it became a source of real concern. And indeed, we know that uh, it was not taken seriously at this time because just two years later in 1972, we have the case of the Euphronius vase, which became very famous. This was brought by the New York Met in 1972 for $1 million. The New York Met claimed it had come from a Lebanese dealer, but we know those papers were forged and that it had been illegally excavated at uh, Chervatory. Um, but, Everybody knew that really this, it had been stolen. Uh, the director of the New York Met and the curator uh, went on American television because it became a celebrity. It was the first ancient vase that had uh, cost a million dollars. That in itself made it a kind of celebrity in uh, New York. Um, and the director and the curator went on the Barbara Walters show um, and uh, were very 
very kind of bullish about what they'd uh, done. Um, and they certainly weren't very repentant to any idea that it might have been stolen. In fact, they rather seem to think they'd done a, a good thing. Uh, Barbara Walters even said to them, but most people say this is stolen. Um, and they clearly didn't take that very seriously. Um, so it can be said that this convention was initially not taken that seriously. And in 2003, UNESCO called a meeting because the convention was just not working. It said that states parties hadn't been signing up to it. There had been a proliferation of clandestine excavations. Uh, just beginning, of course, our sales on the internet and uh, efforts are needed to increase its acceptance and implementation. So it wasn't the greatest success at the beginning, even though it has now become something that is genuinely a benchmark. And the Italian police in particular were starting to get very angry about this. They really felt they were being um, sort of disrespected really. Uh, and they decided to take a more direct approach. And in 2005, uh, they arrested a Getty curator, Marion True. Um, Marion True was um, someone who was a, a curator of ancient art. Um, she stepped off the plane in Rome and stepped straight into the arms of the police who had been investigating an art dealer called Robert Hecht. Robert Hecht had sold um, uh, objects to the Getty and they claimed that um, she knew that these objects were stolen. Um, ultimately, the trial collapsed due to statutes of limitations, which was something that the police allowed to happen because they never really wanted to get at Marion True, they wanted to get at the whole museum culture. Um, Marion True um, made it clear that she was not doing anything that wasn't normal practice in museums at the time. Um, and uh, ultimately uh, a deal was, uh, was arrived at. And the Getty were required to return all of the objects pretty much from the Malibu Villa. Um, none of them had good provenance. And uh, there, was, um, there was a deal arranged whereby the Italians offered to give them items on loan to replace the items returned so that they didn't have an empty museum. Um, and um, in that way, maybe, you know, this would be a way forward. Other um, museums also followed suit. Uh, the Boston Museum of uh, Fine Art also uh, fessed up that they had items that they bought which had no real provenance and that they knew were probably stolen and they returned them. And it really did seem for a while as though um, museums had kind of got the message, as though there was going to be a real turning point, shall we say. Uh, museums put on their website um, new acquisitions policies, they all came up with what were called due diligence um, procedures. Um, so this was something that that they um, it looked like things were going to change. Um, I personally thought they were going to change. I thought we'd turned a corner and uh, we would have a different attitude in museums from now on. But ultimately, that didn't really happen. And the reason it didn't really happen is because of the opposing forces within the art market. Um, the art market became very competitive due to increasing demand. 
uh, there was a big increase in the sales and in the prices. And this is especially so after the 2008 market crash, because other um, items such as houses and land and stocks and shares that previously people had invested in uh, lost a lot of value. But uh, art did not art retained its value. And so people began to invest in art. Um, and the other great advantage of the art market uh, was the almost complete lack of regulation. Um, if you have investments in gold or in oil or in stocks or in shares, they are in sectors of the market that have um, a lot of regulation attached to them. Um, what you what you can do, what you can't do, what you can charge, what is legal, etc. That doesn't really exist for art. How much is a piece of art worth? It's worth what someone will pay you for it, essentially. So the lack of regulation is something um, that was very attractive to investors. And so the art market becomes more and more, um, it gets more and more oxygen into it. Um, prices go up more and more. And museums are competing in a sense against private collectors. They're um, competing against people who want to buy art for investment. Um, and they're often competing on very unequal terms, uh, shall we say, in that they don't have the same uh, revenue behind them. And museums also start to depend a very great deal on themselves being visitor attractions. So for example, this is a long line for Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun um, is one of the real superstars of antiquity. You put on the Tutankhamun exhibition, you will have a lot of visitors. Uh, you will tick every box in your marketing plan. And this starts to become very important for museums, um, particularly the big museums, they're under a lot of pressure to um, keep their status as one of the top museums in the world. Uh, they can lose that status very easily. One of the ways in which you lose it is to not have the most number of visitors in a year. Uh, there's big competition between the big museums to, to be seen to hold the record uh, for this. And it's really, they really started to enter in essence, the sort of be part of entertainment and celebrity culture. Um, and they've definitely moved much more in that direction and less in the direction of um, research and of um, curatorial expertise. Um, it used to be the case that curators were measured on a par with university professors. They were, they were supposed to have a kind of ranking, which was the same as university professors and were supposed to uh, also engage in research in the same way as university professors. But increasingly, their job turned into focusing on visitors and focusing on um, really raising the profile of the museum as part of popular culture and as part of even celebrity culture. So um, here we have um, uh, a still from um, a video that was shot by Beyonce and Jay-Z, which did apparently wonders for the image of uh, the Louvre. Um, but what is remarkable is that it was one of 500 movies and music videos that are shot at the Louvre every year. Um, and obviously the Louvre charges for this and charges quite a lot. Um, 
but that's not probably not even the most important aspect of it from their perspective. The most important aspect of it is uh, the branding that it gives the Louvre title, that, uh, that they are part of this um, celebrity culture ultimately. And all of this leads to a great increase in demand. Uh, there is, you need to have more and more objects in order to feed this market. Now, if you are um, a factory producing items and you have to capacity build, well, that's fairly easy. You build another factory and you can produce more items. But if what you are trying to, what you, if your commodity is antiquities, well, that's a lot more difficult. And this leads to two changes in behavior. You can do either forgeries, and indeed there has been a massive increase in forgeries uh, in recent years. And the forgeries are often inserted into the trafficking of real objects in order to increase the bulk. Um, so you can either do um, forgeries or else uh, you can go and loot objects, um, particularly objects in places where uh, people are more vulnerable. Um, and that is particularly in conflict zones. Uh, conflict zones provide the perfect cover for people to go and loot. Uh, what you're looking at here is a site in Cambodia. You can see that it's been dug up. It's, you see the edges of the pit there. Um, and this happened during Cambodia's civil war, very bloody civil war that happened in the 1990s. And what they have done is chop off the um, statues at the ankles. They were obviously too difficult to dig up. There was a whole series of statues here. And those statues, which were stolen during the Civil War, ended up in America, and they ended up in the Metropolitan Museum, the Norton Simon Museum in California, uh, Denver, uh, Cleveland, um, and all of them had very dubious provenance and all of them were um, illegally excavated. Um, and um, really amongst one of the most awful and bloody civil wars that, um, that has been seen. Um, obviously, during um, conflict, um, museums are a very vulnerable point. This is Kabul Museum, which has been ransacked more than once. Baghdad Museum. Um, and this is a site in Syria. Uh, and on the left of the picture, you have what the site looked like before the war, and then what it looks like now. And if all, every one of these little holes here, and you can see that there are hundreds and hundreds of them, that is a looter's tunnel where uh, someone has tunneled down and has um, taken objects from below the ground. And then what happens is often, usually, in fact, the people who first take the material out of the ground, they usually get very little money for it. We call them subsistence looters um, because uh, they're really just doing it to exist but they sell it on to dealers and it passes up through a supply chain. And that's where the real money starts to be made uh, further up the supply chain. 
um, and ultimately it becomes part of organized crime. And indeed, we also know that it was used by, um, particularly in Syria and Iraq, has been used by terrorist groups to fund uh, their operations. Um, this Operation Demetra was actually a fairly modest organized crime group. Um, ultimately, about 40 people were uh, charged, which is quite small, but it gives you a sense of how it happens. This was based in Sicily. Um, it was based around, actually around Agrigento, which uh, you may know is a particularly spectacular site. Um, there was um, illegal looting of the area around Agrigento. Uh, the objects were put into trucks um, underneath agricultural objects, uh, agricultural food, other items. They were put into trucks and taken to the mainland and then uh, ultimately passed up through the supply chain to Germany. In Germany, they were um, cleaned up and conserved and then they were sold through dealers in Germany. Uh, the money, uh, went directly to London. Um, all of this was being run by a man called uh, William Thomas Veers, who was behind it all. Uh, and then he cycled the money back down into Spain, which is where the, uh, the people with archaeological knowledge were living, um, and in particular led by a man called Andrea Palma, who was a graduate of La Sapienza University of the Archaeology. Uh, and he had studied uh, Sicily at that time, so he knew where to excavate. And that's not just knowing that there's something there, but being able to predict the type of object that's there that would have a, get the most value in the market. That was um, Operation Demetra was uh, busted in 2018. It took four years to ultimately bring them, uh, get the whole gang. It's, as they say, it's a fairly small one in the great scheme of how these operate, but you get the idea. And of course, you can see how easy it is to feed into that system items that come from conflict areas, um, and you can also see how easy it would be to do what they did here in Operation Demetra, which is to inflate the um, your uh, what you're selling by inserting into it forgeries alongside the uh, authentic items. Now, another way that museums try to make money is by franchising their brand name. And the Guggenheim was uh, a museum that did this to great effect in Bilbao. And um, the Louvre has done it as well. Uh, the Louvre uh, has lent its name to this um, beautiful new museum in Abu Dhabi, which has a huge exhibition space. Uh, they've been paid a lot of money for this. Uh, but of course you have to fill this huge exhibition space and you've got to fill it with quality items. When people are paying large sums of money, they want uh, quality. And um, that leads us on to the case that uh, was in the slide at the beginning of the director of the Louvre and uh, how he is now uh, under arrest. He's uh, on bail. The, still being investigated, and he is charged with money laundering. This rare pink granite steel could be at the heart of a potential antique trafficking scandal. The ancient work, which sits in Abu Dhabi's Louvre Museum, was bought along with four other ancient works for 8 million euros in 2016. Now the former president of Paris's Louvre Museum is being formally investigated for complicity and fraud accused of turning a blind eye to the origins for the pieces, despite concerns being raised by experts. The 
Jean-Luc Martinez, who oversaw the Paris Museum from 2013 through to 2021, is suspected of trafficking antiquities. French investigators believed that hundreds of artifacts were smuggled away during the Arab Spring protests. They were then suspected to have been sold to galleries and museums without proper checks into the work's provenance, many of which are suspected to have been falsified, a complicated procedure. No one had to know it was stolen or its true origin. So they'll change the provenance, the date, make false papers. The investigation comes after New York prosecutors found a golden sarcophagus was the victim of false documentation. It was sold to New York's Met Museum for 3.5 million euros in 2017. Martinez has previously denied any wrongdoing. He stepped down as director of the Louvre in 2019, following an unsuccessful campaign to renew his contract. This rare pink. So that is how one director has got himself into uh, trouble. Um, has he been hoodwinked? Did he succumb to pressure to um, fill this massive new museum in Abu Dhabi? Well, we don't know yet. The case is still ongoing. Um, but there, is, there are always dangers when you get into this level of finance. Now, one of the most uh, important celebrity fundraising events every year is the Met Gala at the New York Met. Uh, last year, it raised $17.4 million, just this one event. So you can see how important it is for the museum. Uh, this is another way that museums leverage their uh, venue uh, by renting it out, for, by holding these very prestigious celebrity events. But it got them into a whole heap of trouble when Kim Kardashian was photographed next to uh, this gold coffin. This is the same one that was mentioned in the previous news item. Uh, because people in Egypt immediately recognized this as something that actually belonged to them. And that proved to be very embarrassing. The New York Met claimed that its purchase took more than a year due to a careful study of its 1971 export license. So it's uh, claimed to have been very assiduous uh, now, I want you to remember that date, 1971, because it's very significant, because on the export license was um, this stamp, um, which said that, which is the stamp of Egypt, the United Arab Republic. In actual fact, the United Arab Republic only existed, that was the name for Egypt, only for a very short length of time between 1958 and 1961. So it could not have been on an export license for 1971. And so the export license was a fake, uh, all of which was very embarrassing. And in fact, it was one of a series of items which was taken from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, um, during the Arab Spring riots. Uh, the New York Met had to give it back, obviously very embarrassing, huge loss of money as well. Uh, I think it was three and a half million dollars, um, an apology to the people of Egypt, not, you know, not what you want to have to do if you're an elite museum in the world. Um, how does this happen? How does this all come about? Well, to a large extent, it relates back to what we said before all along. There's never been a very robust attitude towards acquisitions, and that's particularly true if you're a donor. Um, the New York Met had, along with uh, Leon Levy and Shelby White, who were mentioned before, also had a very important donor in the uh, guise of Michael Steinhardt, who uh, owned a hedge fund. And he was a big benefactor to New York Met and also um, sits on the advisory board of Christie's, the auction house, and has a long history of acquiring material um, of dubious provenance. 
Um, this ultimately um, got him um, got him into trouble in December 2021. Uh, his, uh, the, the antiquities uh, squad of the um, New York District Attorney's Office um, determined that he had over $70 million in stolen antiquities. They raided his house. Um, he avoided prosecution by returning all the antiquities and by uh, accepting a lifetime ban. Uh, the district attorney at the time said he had a rapacious appetite for plundered artifacts without concern for the legality of his actions or the legitimacy of the pieces he bought or the grievous cultural damage he wrought across the globe. But he didn't do any jail time. Uh, and wasn't prosecuted. And this is very common in um, antiquities trafficking. No matter how much it is, it does not normally, it rarely goes to prosecution. And that um, doesn't act as much of a deterrence. And I'm going to finish with um, the lady we began with, Shelby White because indeed just a few weeks ago in um, December the 6th, December the 5th or 6th, um, the same thing happened to her. Her house was raided and she was found to have had more than $20 million worth of allegedly stolen items. Um, and indeed many people have said that that was known at the time that that um, new gallery at the New York Met was inaugurated. So that is where I would like to finish. I'm going to stop sharing the screen um, and I'm going to uh, ask my colleagues if there have been any questions, if anybody's brought up anything they would like to um, talk about. So, uh, Sama, um, Kirsty, Zoe, Melissa. Okay, I can see uh, we have some here. Yeah. And I would also like to bring in at this point, uh, Alyssa. Alyssa, I apologize for being a bit over time um, here. Um, are you? My pleasure. Um, so um, I don't know if any of my um, colleagues um, have anything they would like to add before we, Melissa? You've um, been... There are a few questions in the chat. I don't know yeah. if you can see that down there. Yes, I'm, I'm afraid I haven't been able to really follow it, but um, the okay. Q&A I've got, but yeah, can you can you fill me in on something that I should? Um, um, I think that you would be able to speak more to Elizabeth's question about how the Nazi art conference kind of changed the rules on the art market. Right, um, you mean the Washington rules, Elizabeth? Is that, um, I think that's maybe. What? Um, um, yeah, um, I can just say a little bit, though it's not something that I specialize in. Um, there are people who really specialize in the uh, return of Nazi art, but the Washington principles, which people have suggested that we could employ for repatriation, um, that kind of flips the uh, onus of proof. So if you are, um, if somebody makes um, a claim to a work of art that was lost um, because um, it was confiscated by the Nazis or because in some way the um, environment that the Nazis created for Jewish owners of art meant that they lost it. Um, 
then it is up to the institution or the private collector to demonstrate that it is not that as opposed to the um, person who is claiming it demonstrating that they are the owner. The onus is kind of reversed a little bit. So that um, if somebody accuses um, a collector or a museum of having um, works of art that were uh, unjustly taken from Jewish owners who haven't been compensated, the, um, then that person has to, has to demonstrate that they acquired it legally. And indeed, this idea has been suggested for repatriation of items as well, because of course, one of the problems is that if, um, if you have a sort of, well, not a collector, but let's say an, you know, an ordinary person who's trying to claim back something uh, that their family had, and they're up against a museum or a big art gallery, well, obviously it's really difficult for them to, um, you know, to, to fight that case. Um, it's all stacked against them, essentially. So I hope that answers your question, um, Elizabeth. Was, was there anything else, uh, Melissa or Sama or anyone that you would like? Um, I was also wondering um, if you could speak to Godfrey's question concerning the Benin bronzes that have been trafficked outside of the ones that have ended up in Britain, the ones that have ended up elsewhere. Right. So I, you'll have to tell me again. I'm sorry. Uh, let me uh, try. He was just wondering if there are cases of trafficked Benin bronzes apart from the ones that ended up in Britain. Oh, yes. Lots. Uh, yes, huge numbers. Um, if you go to Dan Hicks' book, which I mentioned before, um, he's actually got an appendix which lists them all. Um, uh, and some of them were actually returned, um, ones that were um, in private hands. Uh, when the owners found out uh, the history of the object, they willingly gave them back. Um, and that actually is something that happens more often than you might imagine. People have often picked up um, items without really knowing anything about them. And, um, you know, uh, they don't always fight to the bitter end on it. It can sometimes happen that people will just give them back. Um, so the Benin Bonses, there have, there have been a number of small um people who've just had one or two, but obviously the really big ones are in museums and it's the whole museum collection that needs to go back. And that's a much more difficult thing to, to organize. Right. Anything else, Melissa? It looks like you've had masses of questions to answer and that she's great. Yes, it's been a very fruitful discussion, I think, today. Um, but there's also been a few questions about um, your thoughts on the ethics of museums and museum professionals in the role of protecting cultural heritage. Right, right. Um, I mean, very happy to um, also continue this discussion in on the Facebook page, uh, if you wish, or to uh, you can write to me as well at uh, my AUR address, um, but it's a great thing to also bring up in the Facebook discussion, if you, if you can. Can I jump in for a moment, Valerie? Definitely. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Harry. I'm pretty much the administrator for putting together these things. Uh, you will all have received an invitation to the second uh, webinar, which is on the 12th in two days' time. Um, based on how this worked, I think that we're going to, for the next one, we will enable participant chat so that you guys can talk to each other and help answer each other's questions. And we'll also enable on-screen captioning. So, I mean, if you've got any other suggestions for how to make this work better for you guys, but I think that those two things will really help the discussion flow and and I, I think Val, you'll agree that a lot of other people will have input to these questions that Absolutely. they'd like to add Absolutely. to. Yeah. If I That's can, I will, I will 
we'll save all of the questions from the Q and A. And when when we send you the link to the video of this session, perhaps Val, we can sit down and try and work through some of the answers and include those as a transcript. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, no, that's okay. a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this for us is the first time we've done um, such a large uh, webinar. Uh, and so we're kind of experimenting with how to do it. Um, we're not entirely clear at the moment on how to do it best. So no, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, I look forward to seeing you all. Oh, I see some more questions. I can uh, read some more in. Um, okay, I think we're gonna have to uh, do these or is there a way to have information we don't? I know some of you don't have Facebook accounts. Uh, sorry about that, but we're trying to find another way to have discussions, as Harry says. Um, now, I look forward to seeing you all on uh, Thursday, and we will be discussing Indigenous um, populations. Um, you should by now have the material um, to prepare for that if you wish to course entirely up to you uh, if you wish to do more reading about it um, and watch um, some videos on it uh, really looking forward to that discussion we'll also have with us um, to give us some insight uh, another one of our alums um, who she also did a thesis uh, and an internship on um, indigenous rights and she uh, now works for a law company in Vancouver, in Canada, which uh, specializes in restorative justice for indigenous uh, peoples. So um, she will tell us about some of her uh, work experiences as well. So I really look forward to seeing you all on Thursday and hopefully we can also arrange it so that we have more interaction because that, um, that would be good. Okay, thank you everybody, bye-bye.